We've actually got our following up to 4,000 now. Oh my gosh, that's 2, great success. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, yeah, and then there's been some engagement with uh, with some interesting people. It seems to me that, that there's almost like two audiences or two co cohorts. One is a set of just NFT people who aren't necessarily focused on on climate. And then there's a lot of climate people who are trying to do something very different to just traditional carbon credits. And so been really interested in speaking to this this group of people who are trying to do good and they see that you know some of these traditional carbon credits kind of make a lot of money for the intermediaries and not so much for um, you know benefit for the local communities so yeah there's a lot of interesting stuff going on right on yeah there's a there's definitely a thriving community on Twitter um, of this sort of Web3 um, decarbonization tooling, um, and uh, it's really exciting. So it's it's good to hear that uh, you're you're expanding your reach. And um, have you been uh, have you been doing any Twitter Spaces lately? Funny you should mention that because there are a couple that I was not necessarily invited to as a speaker, uh -huh. but ended up being invited onto the stage. Oh, cool. And so, cool. yeah, so that was interesting. And a couple of the people that, um, three people um, who have been following up with us based on the Twitter outreach we've been doing, have invited us to Twitter spaces as well. Yeah, nice. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Nice. yeah, I've been... Um... <laughs> Feeling pretty enriched by the the conversations that are happening on spaces. I think it's a it's a pretty cool tool. If you ever uh, feel free to ever shoot me a link to to um, some that are going on that you think are interesting, I'll hop in and listen. Yeah, or... will do. Mm -hmm. How have you been, Rice Cracker? been a while it has um finally got my audio working um i had a been a little bit um over committed so i was i've been dealing with a couple other businesses i have so that's where i've been a little bit mia so apologies for that everyone i feel you yeah no, but, for no problem um gonna be gonna be helping out a little bit more on the back end tank bottoms on some of the documentation so oh great yeah so Good. more more work probably less chat <laughs> mm. that's awesome man thanks he has, thanks for coming back he has enslaved many people he's what he has enslaved he has enslaved many people on those documentations <laughs> he has yeah <laughs> he, ha he has a he has a way of doing that <laughs> it's a heavy lift man no joke so help is appreciated for sure what's up sally good morning everyone no news <laughs> are you back in new zealand sure am. all right yep. how's that it's a bit colder than italy that's for sure, but mm. that's all right. Mm -hmm. Getting lighter. Yeah. You've been traveling around a lot the past month or so, huh? Oh, yeah. No, we just had three weeks over. Um, my husband's from the UK, so we went and saw some family and had a little bit of a sneaky trip to some of North Tuscany and then back. Um, yeah, but it was hot. So hot in the UK, I swam in the sea, which was the first time I think I ever did that. And I lived there for almost 10 years. Oh Sorry, Mark. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, I was speaking to someone from the UK yesterday. He said it was 40 degrees there. Oh, wow. Yeah, that's awful. Yeah, we were luckily down in the Isle of Wight. Well, that's not necessarily that lucky, but um, it wasn't uh, in London where it was sounded hideous. I was up there for a bit and it's just hot and crowded. and Yeah, too hot. That's wild. I mean, 40 degrees in England 
that's that's very far outside the normal range, right? Yeah, yeah. I had to Google it. It's 140 degrees Fahrenheit. Yes, <laughs> America. <laughs> <laughs> that is nuts. So yeah. I actually posted uh, an article on the, I think it was on the general chat here a couple of weeks ago. And in 2020, um, a group did an analysis to figure out because of global warming, what would the temperature in the UK look like in 2050? And they created a map and they showed the temperatures of the different cities around the UK. And then they showed a map um, earlier this year and the two maps were almost identical. Yeah, so what maybe. they were projecting for 2050 oh my God. is almost here. Man. Dude, this yeah, is so, so true. Yeah, I saw that you posted that, Mark, and I quickly hurried past it. <laughs> Pretended I hadn't seen it and went, oh, it's a blip. Yeah. It's devastating. Um, the same is true for ocean acidification and the loss of plankton. Um, I feel like somebody posted this in the movement server, but I can't quite remember where I found this article, but it was, um, I don't know if any of you guys have seen this recently, but there's some recent research, like bleeding edge research that's like alarming um, about the loss of plankton in the Atlantic Ocean. And it's it's like, it's like 10 times worse than what was projected uh, and expected at this stage. And, and it's like, has some extreme consequences. Um, but yeah, you know, I mean, something people don't think about with CO2 emissions is that the CO2 is dissolved into the, the ocean and it just increases the acidity, which disrupts the ecology severely and um, a lot of people don't think about that when we talk about the need for carbon sequestration So um, I wanted to ask folks, like, um, you know, this is an interesting, interesting time every week where we get to come together and just kind of update each other on projects, but it can also be a nice opportunity to just share inspiration for, um, you know, what we're doing in the space. Like, it's easy to get on these doom and gloom um, rants about, like, how, like, what what is happening in our world right now. Um, but it's it's also like the reason why I'm here is to to try to create systemic solutions to those kinds of problems. Um, and I think it's it's important to return to that, you know. Um, and so I was curious to just explore and ask folks um, what inspires you about this space and about coming here, you know, and showing up to Movement Dow Town Hall and um, and being in the DAO space in general and Web3 and, and the potential uh, we have to do good here. So if anybody has any, any thoughts or reflections to share on that, I'd love to hear it. I will go. I don't have anything massively um, insightful, but I think I'm glad you took us away from the doom and gloom. Um, I just think that um, you've just got to keep going and be hopeful. And so this is where you, this sort of um, platform is where you can do more than just hope, because obviously hope isn't actually a strategy. Um, and yeah, and, and work, keep, putting one foot in front of the other and keep going forward, I guess. Otherwise you do just sit and throw your hands up. And it feels like when I hear some of the different projects and the potential that things can happen, well, I, whether it 
whether it's fast enough and there's obviously people can say well you should put all your effort into just lobbying government to make change instead I guess but um, I think at the same time you've got to follow where your actual natural passion lies and so I don't feel passionate about um, <laughs> uh, um, lobbying government so I you know you work in the areas that you love and then try and make change from there and I like I think web 3 is a really exciting place to be so that feels like a um, yeah that, that's why I want to work with it and it's new and exciting and and has hope and built stacker And I was going to say too, one of the things I don't know if you know about them, there's a team called Future Crunch, um, which are really worth looking. When you're feeling unhopeful, they're a really awesome um, team to look at. And they're not they're not just rose tinting everything, but they just keep bringing up all the stuff that's happening around the world in both social and environmental change, um, which can be um, nice to see all at once. It gives you a bit of a boost that there is stuff happening at government level as well. Nice. I didn't know the government did things. That's cool. <laughs> <laughs> there was, was things like, I don't know, I think there was like Indonesia, or Indonesia, or India, just things like social change. Sometimes some of those countries that are like moving forward in women's rights or um, probably more social, some of the government and, um, things. But even at some of those smaller ones, I think Indonesia, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it's around the world, some of the changes in the third world. Um, government change as well, which doesn't kind of get the headlines or seem as impressive as, um, um, but you know, and especially some of the third world is pretty important when you look at the drawdown project as well. So it's good to know that there's change happening there as well. Actually, Michael, I have a comment following up on what Sally just said. What gives me hope is the is the disintermediation promise of Web3. And so to a certain extent, in some of these emerging economies, you can bypass an inefficient and effective, ineffective government and get to a project where a someone who owns an asset, whether it's land or whatever it is, can actually gain the value of that asset. And so you end up with decentralized value. And that's what I think is the greatest promise of Web3. Whereas traditionally in the Web2 world, maybe 90% of the value would go to all the intermediaries and the asset owner at the end is kind of um, really um, left out to a large extent in terms of reaping the value. And so there's an opportunity for a huge change when you talk about um, some people in some of these economies that have an ineffective government and also ineffective banking systems and business systems, there's a hope, <laughs> and I hope we can realize that hope. So that's what inspires me. Right on, Mark. Yeah, I, I relate to, I re relate to that. Um, same feeling. Um, it's amazing when we can kind of, I, I, I don't know, it's interesting because we, we, we have this opportunity to, to reinvent what money is and can be and the way that it relates to our value systems. And it's, it's so radically different that it's almost like money isn't even the right word anymore. When we're talking about like, you know, project native tokens um, that can be used to participate in governance, like that in a way falls into the concept of money as like, oh, it's a cryptocurrency, you know, but it's like, we don't even have the vocabulary to talk about what this is because we haven't had these tools before. And, um, but what we have had is a, is a rich history of like, monetary energy as a language that humans use to communicate our values with one another. And we have like this interesting situation in the world where our monetary energy has been like co-opted by a small handful of 
um, conglomerate entities that we call the government. Um, and, and it's like, if you say money, people just think of like, oh, the euro or the dollar. Um, and it's pretty straightforward, but really like what money can be is like highly composable. Um, and if you can remove the intermediary from that process, it's almost like um, you have the opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer communication of values um, and the sort of evolution of, of like value aligned collectives that can um, create their own initiatives and have their own process without, without necessarily needing the intermediary um, of government or bank institutions to be able to, to be able to relate um, and unify and um, have like the foundational groundwork for a value exchange infrastructure underneath. And um, yeah, going into a lot, a lot of that abstract sort of sociology stuff gets my gears turning and I appreciate you bringing it up. It's definitely a part of what inspires me in the space. I would like to share a thought and uh, I'm at a coffee shop right now, so I apologize for any background noise, but, um, you know, I, I know so many people that, you know, they're always saying how they're looking for um, some purpose, you know, and so many people that feel deeply called to, to help in some way and, and the collective humanity and the earth and, and they just struggle in finding, you know, the path to do that, to the path to finding their purpose. And I feel a lot of op optimism here in creating the the platforms and the organized communities to kind of remove that obstacle of of trying to to figure out how to get involved. That we can, you know, set up that that system for people to get involved, whether it's on the the creation and development side or or the activism side. So. That's one thing that really excites me about this is just creating a space that is already set up for people to to step right in and, and get involved and and find their purpose because you know with with um, the environmental problems that we see and, and everything else you know there should be uh, you know we shouldn't have to look any further to to find our purpose because I feel like it's right in front of us and it's to know re restore this balance and to secure uh our future generations so I, I think that's one really beautiful thing i'm seeing emerge here absolutely one of the things yeah, we talked about it, with oh go ahead uh, i was just gonna say and I, I i think my favorite part <clears throat> just about like this space in general and kind of the people we talk to here is just like everyone is super smart and like trying to change the world and is like yeah just experimenting with all these crazy new ways to do it and while everyone is probably not gonna you know like th their their thing might not succeed like a good chunk of people's will and like we only need to find like you know a few that will be huge successes i think that's like a really cool thing is like we're just kind of funneling in all the best minds everywhere and uh like what whether you know some some ideas work or, or don't work like we're all gonna kind of win in the end kind of the beauty of open sourced culture, huh? Is like the effort is worth doing even if you're not the one who wins because you're contributing to the overall idea space. And um, it's like being one of the many seeds casted broadly by a tree knowing that only a small handful of the seeds will germinate, but you needed all of them to try in order to have the chance of, of a few of them growing into a tree. I'll, I'll add a little bit, um, you know, having spent some 
you know, prior years working in the nonprofit sector, but also then working in the corporate sector with startups. Um, I, I love what I love what a blockchain backed entity can do when it comes to just transparency and security and accountability. Um, it also opens up um, a lot more people to access to like these great ideas, these seeds that are germinating and allows the best ones to truly win versus making it like an elitist boys club where you, you've typically in the startup world got these VCs that, you know, crown the king makers in, in, in one sense of the term. Um, you just, you open up, you open up investment opportunities and equity opportunities to the masses, but you also tap their, the collective knowledge base for insights and improvements on those ideas, which I think is really valuable. And then on the, on a nonprofit side where you get into like more of the government space or social, you know, the, the social good or impact, I, I think there you just, there's such an inefficiency um, after spending early in my career, a couple of years there, just such an inefficiency and a waste. And then a lack of, of transfer of ownership to the actual communities that oftentimes received aid or receive, um, assistance and so this I, I feel like really enables the local community to identify and then activate what's what they truly need and be more involved to drive um to drive long-term results versus making people feel good that they were a part of a cause but not necessarily sure how they actually impacted or, or, or what like what was um like the net result of what came out of a lot of the activity. So, so I think it's just a great organizational tool to make things more efficient, uh, more accountable and more transparent. I think that's such a good, I totally agree on the not-for-profit, not that I've got huge experience in it, but my little toe I dipped, I ran away again. Um, but that, um, that idea of ownership and it is in New Zealand we have a lot less money I think from my perception um, in the not-for-profit space but that sense we have a real poverty mindset because of what you say there's no um, there's no ownership people can't have some empowerment around the funds they get or they can't fund themselves it's just going to ask other people for grants and for money that they then hand out um, and also here even grassroots organizations I find it's still it's still actually really centralised. There's still a committee and a chair, and then to have any feel like you're actually part of it, you have to sit, you know, work your work your way up to doing something to influence. So it's um, even though here you might still be a small cog, you're exposed to lots of projects, and you feel like I feel like I can have more impact, even if it's just um, as an enabler. But it's not quite waiting and waiting until you can. You know, I don't want to be chair of the board. Um, whereas in those organisations, it's still actually really, they're all really centralised. Sort of even local, local organisations are still quite traditional in the way they're organised. Um, so yeah, I like the the free flow nature of what we have here and exposure to different projects. I like what you said, Stacker too, about like you say, it could the bigger. You just have to keep working until one or two, one or two strike. They don't all have to be wins to make a difference. Yeah, one thing I've learned is that everything's a funnel. So you just got to kind of catch as many things in the top of the funnel and then, you know, it's all, it's all conversions. This was a cool conversation now. Yeah, this has been great. I appreciate hearing everybody's thoughts and reflections. I think one other point is that um, barriers to entry are, are relatively low, so much lower um, than they have been in the startup world before. 
And um, before we decided to uh, mint on Polygon, um, the Celo blockchain was trying to get us to um, mint, use their blockchain instead. And in speaking with their organization, they were saying they give out grants. And so all of these blockchains are trying to get all of these people who are doing all these great projects to actually launch on their blockchain. So these blockchains give out grants. And when I was speaking with the people at Cello, they were saying that most of the entrepreneurs that they are speaking with do not want to take venture capital. And so Cello and Polygon, all the other, these other blockchains, they give out grants and they normally have a relationship with a group of VCs as well. And they were saying that most of these entrepreneurs didn't even want to speak with the VCs. And I think part of it is that the amount of the grant was enough to get them going anyway, and they didn't have to give up equity. Mm. And so the barriers, the, the financial barriers to entry are, are relatively low. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, a separate point is that you can also really focus on a really small niche. And then if you look at the people around you within range, um, there's probably not a lot of people who are interested in that same niche. But if there's 20,000 or 50,000 people in the world that are interested in it, now all of a sudden you've got the tools to reach all of those people around the world who have got a, the, that, that shared interest. So I think those new tools that have given us this global reach have, has also helped in terms of allowing people to focus in on what they what their specific interest is and pursue it mm. which i think is really liberating yeah i agree that's one of the aspects of what the movement what the move platform can become is a place to go to get connected to impact projects um, and figure out how you can get involved. So kind of one of the product feature visions that I have personally um, that we haven't explored too much about um, what it would take to integrate, but is like a sort of a, a, a collective bounty board that uh, projects on the platform can post to. And in that way, you kind of are curating a, a community of like impact bounty hunters who can make a living by kind of plugging into this um plugging into this functionality of of um integrating like the work efforts between many different projects so we can be independent but united through um common efforts yeah and micah something that's super interesting about that too is like I'm sure if you created that in a way that's like super, you know, like web two friendly, you could have like nonprofit partners that would like post that on their site as like ways to get involved and create a pretty big partner program over, over that. Mm. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. There's been some really incredibly successful crypto bounty um, impact projects. Like one of the very, earliest experiments in that was um it was um it was uh it was called the name the word bounty was in their name it was a very simple name but anyway they just basically put up ten dollar um die bounties for um cleaning up garbage um from waterways and it just blew up and it was incredibly successful and and they were able to fulfill those with grants that they got and so it's i think it's the opportunity to sort of apply um like the the scale of like collective intelligence to um allocating capital um throughout scale so you have like lots of people can have the resources to pursue grants and to find the grants that need to happen but then you also have like the fidelity of being able to put up individual bounties and pay out like ten dollars at a time to people who collect who who um, you know fulfill the, the the value proposition of of those grants, and I think that's 
pretty interesting. Like we're talking about one community garden and if you are one community garden, it's hard for you to have like the resources you need to apply for all of the grants that you might be able to get for benefiting your local community with exercise opportunities, um, social connection, mental health, um, you know, food, food security improvement. Like there's a ton of grants that are available, but for one community garden to, to know how to, um, to gain that value is a stretch. But if you have a collective of community gardens that's connected globally, um, then you kind of, you have the, you expand the amount of resources you have to be able to benefit from um, everything that's out there. And so I think this sort of creating value aligned Web3 collectives is, is like a great way um, for local projects to maintain their sovereignty while also benefiting from the scale, like global scale of, of collaboration. Yeah, it's always um, the vision that we hopefully will get to where we've got that little a marketplace or an ecosystem for people to easily go and either have a, as you say, a career and impact with helping lots of different um, organisations or even people who want to just do volunteer work, but they want to do use their skills. Um, I think that's there's I think there's somewhere in I've seen a couple of ones which are not the same but it's a pro bono like you can go in it's sort of like a marketplace for charities to put up work that people can go and then um, do the work pro bono um, so it's still a marketplace in that perspective but um, that's probably selfishly for me this whole movement is being um, you know a it, it, a, a older uh, mother and my intersection of people around me are all concerned about the environment but you know busy working doing their own thing so it's a real um, privilege I guess that I can then engage in with people who are working on something that I'm passionate about but don't know previously it's re even in New Zealand just in my own small um, country it's really hard to engage so having it for me if there was a marketplace you could go to and do that work I think would be amazing Yeah, it's been a rewarding conversation. Um, is there anything else that anyone would like to share today? Sweet, sweet. Well, it's been a pleasure, you guys. And uh, be seeing you next Thursday, if not sooner. And I hope you all have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you, Michael. See ya. See ya. Likewise. Thanks, everybody. Right. Cheers, everyone.